hello. Welcome, everybody. Hello. And welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get into it because, I mean, we're here to really talk shop. Like, e each of you has built an incredible business with your show after, like, pivoting from being so well-known and loved on a completely different media platform for so long. So to start off, I want to know, Christy, we can start with you. What motivated you to transition from your original media platform into podcasting? Um, it's interesting. So I've had uh, several uh, second acts, I guess you could say. <laughs> I think uh, the first second act was when I decided to become a YouTube creator. Yes, 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 yes. And I, I, I was always watching YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't grow up with social media. I'm um, very much like an elder millennial. Um, so once I started seeing a lot of other Disney Channel actors benefiting off Twitter and sort of making these huge milestones, which really helped them succeed past Disney, I was like, well, I'm still, you know, at Columbia University. I'm not sure what I'm going to do if I'm going to be in front or behind the camera. So eventually, though, I decided to lean into it because sometimes the only way out is through and uh, decided that my husband and I would team up um, and we started making content which ended up becoming a cooking show and then some really interesting, I will call it um, almost like a digital memoir of sorts that was causing a lot of virality in my life at the time. But then, yeah, I think the idea of owning your narrative um, and then also building community uh, is what really kind of sparked me to find podcasting. It was a very natural evolution, which it makes sense because podcasting is now everywhere. <laughs> it literally is right? everywhere. It literally is everywhere. And, and podcasting also brought the two of you together, Dave and Christy. I, I know you all. I listened I listened to your episode on, on Dave's podcast, so I know that you all had met long before that. But talk to me um, about how you made your transition into podcasting, Dave. Uh, I was on a TV show. Little show. Uh, no, I... I um, I wanted to do something different in podcasting. I wanted to do a television show uh, that could also be a podcast. So when I met Brendan Rooney, um, Christie's husband, I pitched that idea to him and he said, absolutely, let's do it, a thousand percent. And I said, I want to shoot our show like a television series so that uh, as we expand, we can expand that format into lots of different media. Instead of just audio components, we can have visual components, mm -hmm. and we can build on that. And so once we decided that we wanted to do that, um, I realized I've never watched Full House. So <laughs> the show that I pitched them was going to mean that I, wait, it gets better, ma'am, come back. She's like oh, running, honest. too. She's oh, like, I'm yeah, out. I'm going to finish this. Uh, so then I realized, OK, because we're going to be scripted, I'm going to have to watch all of these episodes and, uh, and write these shows. So it was just a different way of starting a podcast with, I guess, a different ideology. And uh, it's been a blast. <laughs> yes, I know, I, I, did that I answer your question? No, it didn't. No, it absolutely oh, okay. did. And it seems like it's been a blast. <laughs> um, but Nick, we got to ask, how, how, did, how did you decide to get into podcasting? I was telling Nick before we started, my best friend from high school, she's never missed an episode. And she was like freaking out when she when she heard that I was going to be talking to you. Um, and so, yeah, I'd really love to know because like, you know, for you, it's like it's it's also a family affair as well. Uh, yeah, it's it's really been a blessing. Um, you know, for me, you know, a lot of, I I come from a, a different show, The Bachelor. Um, and a lot of people who come off that show are, you know, it's like you don't know what to do with that opportunity you're gifted. And um, you are often given a platform via social media. And there's a lot of like, well, what should I do with this, you know? Um, and most people are kind of on social media trying to, you know, that's like a lot of creators who built their platforms, you know, they, they built their platform because they, you know, maybe it's cooking or whatever it was that they, they grew their audience by doing something that was, uh, you know, they're already passionate about where for me, I was gifted my platform for being on a TV show, mm -hmm. you know, and so people at, at first just followed me because of the character I was on the show or they wanted to follow my quote unquote love story. And then afterwards, you're just like, well, what do I do with this platform? Mm. 
and you're, you almost have to retrain your audience a little bit. And so you're kind of trying all these different things, and it's hard to be vulnerable on social media and kind of show your life. Um, and to me, it was like when, I, when podcasting came out, uh, I felt like I was a bit long-winded. You know, I was told that <laughs> very often by people. Um, but I, it, it, to me, it was a platform where I felt like I could share ideas and thoughts and just have interesting conversations. And then I could pick and choose the spots where I wanted to share parts of my life. Hmm. By also, but also bring on guests and just have conversations about life and romance and dating and pop culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, but it, it, to me, it was just a way that I, it was a platform where I felt like this could be something I could actually build a career on, you know, rather than, you know, uh, rather just posting videos and things like that. So for me, I was just looking for what is the thing that I could take advantage of this opportunity I was given from being on TV and then build my own thing from that. And, and podcasting was definitely the platform that worked great It's an interesting me. point that you make about, um, about like retraining your audience because, I mean, even listening to your show, there's a very specific like format. I work now in radio. I used to not work in radio. I used to work in podcasting. There's a difference between that and public radio because like, Radio, people are listening like you're part of their routine. So it's like, you know, two minutes in, they expect this to happen. Eight minutes in, they expect that to happen. Um, And I was really impressed listening to your show because, like, I mean, you got a serious flow on there and things happen in a certain way. Um, It's a very interesting approach to thinking about that, though, like retraining your audience. I'd I'd really love to hear from you, uh, Christy and Dave, about how, you know, you all were able to sort of figure out how to, um, I guess, engage your existing like fans like like existing fans or existing audience and and get them to uh tap into you in this new place okay do you would you like to yeah okay <clears throat> podco which i'm co-founder my husband in the audience brendan rooney is the ceo um i feel like my other half is not here but he's right there um we are a video uh forward network and what i find that at least specifically in the female millennial space, mm-hmm. for me, as a, another female, it's like they really love the aesthetic. They really rely on that kind of engagement um, in, a, in a really intimate way. Um, so I think it also transcends a lot of our other podcasts so that we can create viral moments online. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, I was actually one of the first people to bring the idea, I was like, look, you know, there's folks like, you know, I saw Drew Afualo and other people who I admired who were really popping up with these amazing sets and amazing aesthetics. And I was like, listen, Podco is got these amazing traditional Hollywood talent, right? Like Dave and the Ned's Declassified right. uh, cast. And we will continue to do amazing things with those sort of tentpole people. And it's like we can utilize them by also navigating on a high elevated aesthetic level. So that's why we engage in a way that's video forward. Mm, interesting, that's really interesting. What about you, Dave, how do you think about it? Well, we, and when I say we, the, the Full House cast, we love our Full House family. <laughs> and what I mean is our, our you know, our, our fans. And so I knew that I wanted to give something back to those fans, but that they also were going to have certain expectations. And so when I originally started writing the first 10 episodes, I was writing them in a vacuum. I really didn't know what the fans wanted mm-hmm. all these years later. And what they wanted that we, we found out was they just wanted to hear more about Full House, a show that they either, uh, the first generation were the kids who watched it on ABC, mm-hmm. or the next generation saw it in uh, syndication, or you know those kids that originally watched Full House said, you know, now my kids are watching Full House with me and I'm getting to relive all those memories. So it was kind of taking all of that together and trying to do a visual representation of that. Mm. And when I first started, I had had this idea of, I want to do Pee Wee's Playhouse meets Full House. So I had puppets that would pop in the window. So I had Comet the dog (laughs) popping in and I had the Mr. Woodchuck puppet popping in and I created all these characters. And... I realized quickly that's not what the Full House fans wanted. They wanted more of an ecocentric feel about each episode. So after those first 10 episodes, I went to Brendan and we kind of put our heads together and I said, I really want to write this more right into the sweet spot that people 
love. Hmm. And that's where we're at now. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's so interesting. I wonder, like, how, in thinking about, like, each of your personal brands, how did you think about um, approaching your content from that perspective? Like, being able to show either an aspect of your personality, maybe you felt like people didn't get to engage with before, or um, figuring out how to stay authentically yourself in a new medium. Nick, I'd love to hear from you about that. Well, mine's really interesting because, again, I come from the reality TV space, and it's, um, you know, if you're on reality TV, you often feel like you're, you're, you're shown a version of yourself, you know. Um, but not not who you really are, or right. you're siloed into a certain type of personality. Right. And so, like I said before, kind of almost retrain your audience. Where, you know, before I felt like people were following me to like watch my life, either through a, you know as a fan or through judgment. You know, sometimes people watch reality TV to mm. you know hate watch hate and things watch. like that, yeah. uh, which is really interesting. Um, and then, but. I, now it's like I, I have an audience, instead of following me, f you know, to follow me, it's more to follow what I have to say, um, which feels more meaningful. And, um, you know, and then I try to, you know, figure out, like, you know, when you're on The Bachelor, your, your, your platform is generally women. Um, right. And so here I was, a guy who, you know, had an audience of women, and unless I wanted to talk about, you know, me searching for love constantly, which can be a bit exhausting, um, how did I? How do I continue to relate to my audience and have something that they'd be interested in saying that's also authentic to myself? And I've always been interested interested in social dynamics and interpersonal relationships, mm -hmm. and I've always been a fan of pop culture myself. So that, you know, when I created my show, is you know that's why when people ask me what my show is about, I'll say it's a relationship and dating podcast, relationship and dating pop culture podcast. So we'll use pop culture events and TV shows mm -hmm. that are about love and relationships and use that as a launching pad for conversations about real life relationships. Um, and you know that, that will drive the conversation and we just try to lean into that. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that was a great answer. That was really, <laughs> you've given me something to think about. This is good. Oh, you were gonna say, Christy. I think Nick uh, is bringing up a really great point, which is the lens you bring, right, as the talent and as the creator and, and your perspective, it, it, it's married to the concept of authenticity, which I find is always under a microscope. Are they really authentic? Is this what they really think? It, you know, they're monetizing their content. How real are they? Um, and so, but it goes back to the lens and like how you retrain them into trusting you and that you showed up to film this content because you care. Um, on top of it being monetized. And it is, a, it is a constant dance for people to understand you're showing up in that way. So uh, the lens is really valuable, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you watched The Bachelor, you, you, would, you knew me as the unlucky in love guy. <laughs> and so, you know, and I, you know, I... I was that as Joey Gladstone yeah. on Full House, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm really Never sorry. got a date. But with puppets. Jesse got all the We chance. need to buy you a puppet. Uh, <laughs> You know, and I guess there was some truth to that from the TV show standpoint. And and before I ever went on The Bachelor, I you know I had my pitfalls in relationships as well. Um, but I was also always the friend growing up that would give the tough love to my friends, and I was generally pretty good at giving relationship advice. And I learned a lot about relationships through my own failures. You know, and so I, you know, was a willing enough to be vulnerable. Where you know I went from. I always say on reality TV, you get incredible access and no credibility. You know, going on reality TV, yeah. a lot of people are fascinated with you. So it opens up a lot of doors. A lot of people will meet you because they have questions about that world. But they don't meet you because, you know, they think you have something to offer. You're just more of a, you know, uh, I don't know, like, a, what's the word I'm thinking of? You're, there's, it's just fascinated with you. Mm. And so I felt like I always had to earn my credibility. So when I started talking and offering relationship advice, it was a lot of, like, why would we listen to this guy? Um, and then it was begrudgingly, like, wow, I guess he offers some pretty good advice. And so, like, even still now, I still deal with uh, when people discover my show and they realize where I come from, I think they're a bit surprised. It's like, why should I listen? But it's, you know, the proof's in the pudding, so to speak. And which is almost, I appreciate because, you know, I think what podcast offers as a platform is a stickiness with your audience. I think if you get 
people listening to your show, you know, regardless if it's regardless of the size of your audience, there there's a loyalty there. There's yeah, a community well, that you're building. You become like a part of their Yeah, life and and so yeah. you know, when you offer them, you know, sound advice or uh, you know, things like that, regardless cuz I always just say like when people call into my show or offer advice, you know, there's not an episode you listen to where I where I say, "Listen, I am not an expert. <laughs> I, I'm not a therapist. You know, just take or leave it." But like, this is my experience, you know, and that's that's been helpful for me to connect with my audience. Brittany, can yeah. I just say that Nick and I we just met and we share uh, two guys as friends, Josh Peck and John Stamos. Right, right. So we just took a selfie and sent uh, that to John and Josh, and John. Uh, started making fun of me right away. Um, <laughs> but we didn't realize it, but we're going to start a clothing line with flannel shirts, I, blue I, jeans, I thought you all that and brown you. boots. So I love that for Wait, you. But Dave, I want to yeah. ask you, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about that, that where you kind of, um, you, you have a, I mean, a slightly different experience than, uh, well, than Nick, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bachelor in Full House with two different experiences. But, um, <laughs> but also with Chrissy is that like, whereas like, I mean, I grew up watching you on, on TV all the time, Chrissy, and you as well. Dave, but I grew up with you. So yeah, when like you literally return, same age, right? right? So if, yeah. yeah. So if, when you return as an adult and you're like, these are my experiences, um, that makes sense to me because we've grown up at the same rate. Whereas like you, Dave, like a lot of your audience grew up with you. And as you said, they like, will come I just have you. one more chin now. <laughs> <laughs> he looks great. You look great. You really he do. He looks really great. No, but I mean, I'm 97 years old. <laughs> so good for 97. 97. But I'm wondering, how did you think about, how do you think about like, uh, how you wanted to like package and express your values in this new medium for somebody where people didn't grow up with you, but grew up kind of on you. It's, uh, but they're media, they're media yeah, podcasts at a different stage. Yeah, that's life. an interesting question. I have to stay true to the subject, which is Full House and people's love of the series. And um, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I have to constantly be aware of that. You know, so many people have come up to all of us, the whole cast from Full House, and they say, you know, you were my television family. You know, I didn't have a, a great childhood, but you were my family on Tuesday and Friday nights, especially TGIF, that I could feel like I was part of something. So that's always, as a writer of this now, looking back at the show and discovering all these new moments that I've never seen before, I had to be very aware of, of that element with fans. I had to kind of share the love, but also understand that they're looking at it through a different a different lens too, as kids, as adults, and now mm -hmm. you know a different generation. So um, so it was a lot of pieces trying to come together to to make something that everyone would enjoy. That's so interesting. I wonder. I mean, uh, look, I've, I've I've been in podcasting for a long time. I started in 2014. Oh my God, that's 10 years ago. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've been doing it. I've, I've been. I started 10 years ago, and I've 1944. Seen things 1944. That's how I feel, and that's how. A lot of my colleagues look at me now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've seen things change so much, and, and I know, and I'm sure you know as well, that advertising is always something that you're trying to crack and figure out and, you know, f figuring out which brands are the right fit and, you know, and, and how are you going to how are you gonna pay the bills and keep the lights on? Um, I would love to hear more from each of you about how um, you have figured out how to make advertising work for your respective shows and businesses, because I mean, I listen to all y'all shows. I mean, y'all are reading ads, so the money's coming in. But how how have you figured out how you want to work with advertisers and and what's worked, and and maybe if, if you want to share, not worked for you. Go ahead, Nick. Um, not to sound cliche, but it really is just about authenticity. You know, um, again, when we're doing our show. You know, we're just trying to always talk about things that we're passionate about, things that we're interested in about, interested in. You know, just the content we're talking about, mm -hmm. and and with that, you know, we kind of embed our lives and our interests. And so, uh, when we have an opportunity to do ads, you know, my hope is that our our ads don't necessarily feel like ads. You know, certainly there's certain copy we have to no, to I just read you and, put your and own things twist we on. have to touch on. Yeah, but. My, I, I want. I'm offended when people are, you know, the idea of someone would forward through an ad because to me, an ad's part of the show, mm. um, and I want to have as much creativity and fun with our ads, obviously, as long as we touch on the points that the brands are looking for. 
Um, but again, it's it's a way to talk about the things that have affected our life. I mean, you know, uh, the mattress, you know, me and Natalie sleep on. We're obsessed with it. We are diehard customers. And I'll say, What's I promo believe code. It. I believe it. I believe um, it. <laughs> and uh, and there, you know, he, Helix is a sponsor of the show, and it's. I, I light up every time I get to, to read that ad because I'm passionate <laughs> about the mattress I sleep on or the, the, the cookware we cook on. And so when we actually get to promote brands that we use every day or part of our life or whether it's me or you know other people on the show that we have, you know, I, we, call, we refer to them as the household, but um, yeah, it's just fun, you know, and, uh, and I think that draws more sponsors and, and have, you know, and wants brands to connect with, you know, be a part of our show because, you know, they're embedded into what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd love to hear from you on this, sure. uh, Christy, because I mean, when I think about the demographic that you're a part of and that you appeal to, millennial women, uh, th that is um, oh. an increasingly important advertising sector. I'm and it's also complicated, not to interrupt, I'm but No, sorry. no, no, I mean, I, I would love to hear more sure. about that and also how you think about, uh, like, you know, enticing brands to work with you um, for your show. That's exactly where I was going with it. There is a big difference we're finding in our data and the way that we've observed my brand and then uh, the Podco universe, I guess you could call it, and all the brands of those individual um, celebrities and it's 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 aspirational versus inspirational right like so whereas when somebody sees you know um, a TikTok star coming up and now they've reached I think velocity with being on the Oscars red carpet they're more of a journalistic medium and that's amazing for them and that's fantastic that they're able to take the bull by the horns um, and then we have to approach it differently where we see um, d very different trajectories for traditional celebrities. And so even if they haven't been on shows for a while, th the way that our advertisers connect, especially if they've grown up with us, I, th I find there's a lot of millennial women that are buyers right now and representatives of buyers. So they know me, there's already like a shorthand or they know Dave and, and of course Nick. And it's so it's like one of those things where there's already, I don't have to explain to you my value, it's kind of already understood. Um, so that's fantastic, but the complication comes in the inspirational where you see a Chris Olson from TikTok and you're like, let's root for him or maybe we'll throw him in Paris Fashion Week and what kind of cool voyeuristic content he makes. And, you know, seeing someone who's considered a celebrity starting like Kiki Palmer or something, so starting to wear, right, you know, right. the brands and be at the places and do the things. Like the aspirational aspect. The, j the jump can be so much faster. And like I said, the awareness is already, I mean, that person, like you said, they grew up with you. So it's like decades of influence that you are, are able to get from the, yeah. Interesting, that's so interesting. How about, how about you, Dave? How do you think about, uh, well, first of all, your ad reads are hilarious <laughs> because Oh, thanks. You well, you are you are good at bringing a full ho house pun around <laughs> for every single brand that you work with. Well, Brittany, I uh, I started in the world of advertising when I was a struggling stand-up comic. I went to work for an ad agency and I was a copywriter, so I understand what clients are going for mm. in the ad world. And um, certainly with Full House, we're afforded this luxury of having a very wide family dynamic. So the demographic is really, really a wide universe. It's from little kids to grandparents. So that's kind of the luxury that we have just because of the nature of I mean the family. That's in, I mean, that's incredible. That's almost impossible to yeah, find. I feel yeah, like we're, we're a, a trusted brand. But going back to what Nick said is I try to have fun with them. You know, because sometimes uh, you, you don't want to lean in. You kind of want to almost play against type. Like, um, you know, we do some ads that could be taken very seriously. So I don't want to, I don't want to make fun of that so much as have fun with it. Mm. So I try to have fun with the copy and bring part of myself to each of these reads because I agree with what Nick said is that it's part of the show, you know? So it's like, well, I really kind of have built a standard with the show. So I want the ads to kind of live up to that same standard. Hmm. No, I think, I mean, the thing is, is that, like, uh, yeah, when I when I hear, I mean, also, too, I think, 
because you all are so experienced at like being on camera, both as yourselves and as characters, that there's like a different quality to the ad reads also <laughs> that, that comes across very authentically in a way that it feels like it's folded into the show, which I think is also something that's really important for being able to like approach advertisers that you can really connect with listeners. Um, that's the thing that they care about the most. I'm wondering, you know, as you each have worked in you know a di like other platforms before coming to podcasting what are some of the like things that you've had to adapt to or to learn to become successful in podcasting Nick you, you seem ready uh well I just think you just have to always evolve you know I'm I think we're closing in on 750 episodes uh, on my show. That's a um, lot. That's a I, lot. And when I think about what my show was at episode, you know, five, I mean, there's, there's, you know, hints of what it is now uh, for what it was, but it's drastically different. And um, so we're just, I'm always trying to keep it fresh and, and think of new ideas and just try to adapt and grow with my audience. And as we've, we've expanded and to me, I, you know, we have basically, we have one show, but we have three different shows embedded into my show. Right, right. Um, and there, there's a bit of strategy behind it. So we have our Ask Nick, which is just relationship-driven. People call in, share their relationship stories. You, you give good advice. Thank you. And uh, we offer some advice. Uh, some people listen for the advice. Some people just listen because they like listening to other people's problems. <laughs> um, but those episodes are evergreen. You know, uh, episodes that we recorded three years ago, you know, relate, you know, relationship stories never go out of style. Uh, other shows, other, you know, then we have our reality recap, which is very pop culture, very talking about current events, current TV shows. So those drive the conversations on its own. So that, those are very content giving episodes. And then we do our interviews with, you know, relative, or, I mean, um, relatable and, um, and, and popular public figures. And sometimes those are more evergreen depending on the guests. And sometimes, you know, for example, we had the opportunity of interviewing Gypsy Rose right out of prison. Great, great episode. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, and that might, you know, a year from now might not be as, as uh, you know, significant as it was when we, we got to do it. And so when I get a guest like Gypsy, to me, it's like, you know, that I'm going to see a bump in listeners, you know. Uh, and my hope is that the other shows that we have and the quality that we put into the shows the question is how much of those listeners that are tuning into my show for the first time are going to stick around. And Conversion, if they do stick yeah. around, those evergreen episodes that I have, they can go back and binge. You know, So there's hundreds of Asnik episodes that if they find my show and they're very you know, interested in you know, finding love or just struggling with their own relationship or just kind of fascinated in other people's lives, there's a whole catalog of shows that they could go back and listen to. And so... You know, it's just like I have shows to bring audience number, mem members in, and I have shows to keep, keep audience yeah. to keep them. And so I just I, I keep trying to evolve that strategy, and just keep trying to think about what's going on in the zeitgeist of pod, pop, pop culture and podcasting. And we're always constantly thinking about what can we do next. Hmm. So smart. My husband's over there. He's like, "That's smart." <laughs> <laughs> Podco's interesting. We have very different focuses for everything that we green light. Um, we're really lucky with Dave because he does have such a, a four quadrant kind of thing happening over there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to our loyal, amazing audiences for Neds, they're very different than our Wizards of Waverly pod. You know, they're just, their personalities are different. Their profiles are different. Yeah, are there some similarities in the Venn diagram of the demo? Yeah, but their interests are different. And so trying to find uh, the sweet spot of catering to each of those um, on any day of the week, because we really try not to cannibalize our, our, our right. you know what I'm saying? All of our various podcasts. And like m my main podcast, which is Vulnerable, is very mental health focused. It's got a lot of hard topics at times. Another thing I'll mention when you had mentioned Gypsy, I couldn't get her yet. I couldn't get her. She's stuck in Louisiana. <laughs> um, but we did DM, and now she follows me. Um, I, I have very parasocial relationships with my guests. Um, I'm a little bit of a hustler. I'm a little bit of bootstrapping it. Me and my husband, who's a former Marine, we kind of like really created everything from the ground up. 
no outside financing wow. as of yet. Um, a lot of my like Walmart sponsorships will sometimes be like, let's let's green light this new thing. We are having such a blast because nobody's like telling us what to do. Uh, so we're green lighting ourselves, which is a part of the beauty of this this process for us. And we really do love working with new sponsors and and like I said, finding new new audiences to cater to. Hmm. Dave, I'm wondering even from a creative perspective, like what have you discovered since, um, discovered about like w whether that's the way that you, um, like things that you might like to try that, that might work in this new platform or just discovered about the creative process. What have you sort of learned about yourself or, or you know, how you work um, from transitioning into podcasting? Well, with Full House, we're kind of locked into an era of mullets, the Beach Boys, and Tiffany. <laughs> so uh, we have to, you know, we have to play into that, right. but also keep the conversations when I have guests on to today, relevant to today. We had our friend uh, Josh Peck on the episode, and mm -hmm. I was asking him about Oppenheimer. But we have to kind of button hook everything back into full house and kind of keep everything under the roof. We right. don't want to we don't want to stray too far off. You know, we want to make sure that we wrangle it back in and get back to that that subject matter that people love. Which makes sense because it is an anchor point, right? Like mm -hmm. that show is so transcendent that that's the anchor. Yeah. I wonder, how do you think about? Uh, you know, approaching the the well, balancing that approach between the creative and the business side of things, like how, like thinking about making content that's fresh or that's pleasing or fun to make, while also thinking about you know keeping in mind sponsors and keeping in mind you know your schedule and and everybody that you have to work with and making sure that you have you know all of the business side of things taken care of. How do you balance those two things? Anybody want to start? Uh, when I was 19 at the Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, Robin Williams was the biggest comedy star in the world. And uh, he saw my set that night. I had a pretty good set. And he came up to me afterwards. He said, oh, you're a funny. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. He said, oh, you're really funny. And, you know, uh, what are you going to do? And he said, you know, the, the, the most... Uh, important thing you need to remember is that show business is 10% show and 90% business. Mm. And that thought stayed with me, you know, and here's the biggest comedy star in the world telling me, you know, treat this like a business. And I've never thought about that. So that balance for me is have fun, mm. do something that you love that makes you laugh and makes you feel really good about doing, and the business part will come but you always have to be thinking of that, that business uh, component first and foremost because you're not going to last very long if you don't have a great business model. Mm, very good point. Yeah, I would just e echo what Dave said. I mean, before I went on TV, I was in sales selling software uh, for a company called Salesforce. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, some of you guys might know about them. Um, <laughs> And so when I came out to, to L.A., you know, I went, I was, you know, in my mind, I, was, I just went from selling software to selling myself, you know. Um, and, um, and to me, I knew what I was giving up, you know. I had a great job. I had a, a job I enjoyed, a, a nice uh, income, and, and I gave that all up to try to make it out in Hollywood. Mm. And so to me, I was always kind of measuring that against what I, what a, the job that I had. And so... I wasn't out here to kind of and you know, go to the parties and, and network. I was there to work, and so everything I was doing, I, I you know, I, I woke up on a Monday. I didn't necessarily have a place to go, but my mindset was Monday through Friday that you're working, right? And so work to work was maybe taking an improv class or taking a meeting or just, you know, I always just trying to keep myself busy. And then once things kind of picked up. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, you're always, to me, it's, it is work. I enjoy, I'm lucky enough that I love what I do. Um, and now, now I have a team of people I'm managing and now I'm doing like, you know, monthly reviews and things like that, which is, you know, nothing I thought I'd be doing once I moved <laughs> out to Hollywood. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's great. And as far as the content, like if you, if, if, if you enjoy doing it and you, you know, if the quality is there, the, you know, again, the ads will come, you know, and to me, just the business side of it is just, again, trying to stay 
you know, current, you know, right now we're trying to look at different technologies that we can invest in to make us more efficient, you know, when it comes to like the editing process and just the creative process, like what tools are out there to keep us, you know, cutting edge and things like that. And other than like, you know, staying on top of that, you know, as long as the content's there and we're having fun, it usually works out. Oh, gosh. Repeat that question for me. <laughs> I'm wondering how how do you uh, how do you approach or balance how do you balance the creative aspects right. um, along with the business aspects? Uh, it's very hard as a parent with young children who lives in Austin <laughs> um, to basically be going back and forth to be filming two different podcasts, um, co-hosting one and then being a solo host on the other. I traditionally have gone in for four days at a time and I'll do six episodes back to back to back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always very curious about like how you're such a powerhouse and how that's sustainable and now you're a new dad. It's like, it's always really wonderful to connect with other folks to be like, is this, it's not all easy, right? Like it is very <laughs> hard. So um, while yes, it is, it's really lovely to get to like book an amazing guest and you know that's gonna convert and you know that's gonna be cool. Right. And then sometimes a news cycle, it, it actually kiboshes the, the conversion that you would have otherwise got, right? Mm. Um, you can't help that. You still are kind of in a journalistic medium in that way when you're posting online. You have to compete with everything on the internet. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think that yes, while it is fantastic, and um, over time you you learn how to 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 get that loyalty. There, it's it's not uh, it's not like um, it's not easy. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, I mean. One question that's been on my mind um, is is how you all think about measuring success. I mean, obviously, everybody seems to be creatively fulfilled by the work that, that you're doing. But I wonder, like, in terms of business metrics and, um, like, audience growth, how do you how do each of you define success? Nick, you seem ready to answer. Uh, a saying I picked up in my sales force days is shavings make a pile. And I've... I've you know, I really am passionate about that idea, you know, because to me it's just all about long-term growth, you know, because you, can, you can't live and die by the peaks and valleys of, you know, b having a great guest Absolutely. and then, you know, like, oh, how do you follow Gypsy Rose, you know, things like that, yeah. you know. But, again, if, if over time, you know, our growth looks like this, then I'm happy, you know. And to me it's just, you know, because sometimes you, you might book – book a big guest and it falls through, you know, and mm -hmm. again, emotionally, it can, it can be really draining to, to really, you know, hang on to those peaks and valleys. And so you just try, to me, it's always the long game vision, you know, how much do we grow over course of a year or two or three years? And as long as there's consistent growth, that's generally how I measure it because I can get really bogged down in the analytics. So I try not to because sometimes that it's almost has an adverse effect because I'll I'll get too granular and so I try to look at it from a 30,000 foot view and as mm -hmm. long as we're growing over time and just having small successes that add up over and over and over that tends to work out hmm. Hmm. Um, full house believe it or not didn't start out as a big hit we were panned by the press um, Tom Shales from the Washington Post said we were a direct ripoff of a movie called Three Men and a Baby. This show will never work. And, you know, when you're a brand new TV series, you, you know, you, you hear that stuff and it's like, wow, maybe we're not going to make it. And our executive producers, two, two men um, who had produced Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy, uh, Family Matters, Step by Step, Tom Miller and Bob Boyette, they pulled us aside and they said, don't pay attention to what anybody else is saying because there's an audience that is growing behind the scenes that loves you. This is one man from the, New York, from the Washington Post. That's his opinion. And so what that experience gave me is kind of echoing uh, what Nick said is, you know, you, you can't live through the peaks and the valleys. You have to really just kind of look at how are we growing and be patient with that and really kind of stick true, stay true to yourself and just stick with what you feel is working, you know, and be very comfortable in that. Because when we first started Full House Rewind, I didn't know what the audience wanted. And, and so we started out like gangbusters, and then because of the SAG strike, SAG 
because you pause, Full House, you pause production, yeah. Full House was a, a struck show um, because it's from Warner Brothers Studios. So they asked us to stand down and we wanted to be, you know, we wanted to honor the actors and the union and so we did. And so once we did that, all of our metrics just caved and they kind of punished us when we came back saying, oh, well, you went away and now we're going to kind of punish you electronically and digitally. And um, we couldn't think about that. We thought, wait a second, we, we have great audience response. It's building and we're seeing this. We're seeing the show climb. So you really kind of have to listen to your own inner creative voice at that point and just, and just kind of trust yourself. Hmm. Success is an interesting word, especially in our climate right now. It's like, am I successful if I'm not problematic? If, am I successful if, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, how, how do you define yourself as, as a success, um, as, a, as a public person and a content creator? Um, look, I think that was, that was hard. That was hard to stand by and know what an amazing show that we had and how we wanted to comply with SAG's rules as a, as a company and to see just such an amazing start that it had and and to sort of watch it now come back. It really is gratifying to hear you say that, Dave, and I really appreciate you coming all the way to Austin for all this. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing that's being built. I think success for Podco is the legs. Like right now, we're starting to see a lot more interest and we're booking for several podcast live shows. Um, and that to me is a big way to like connect and engage and also like invite sponsorships of a whole new breed. You know, we look at things in almost like a 360 lens as well, a model, so that you're not only necessarily able to advertise on the show, you know, pre-mid, whatever. Right, right. But you could also probably go out because we have such amazing, compliant <laughs> talent. They're like, sure, I'll go on my, my socials and post for them. You know, like, wow. we, we are very, like, all-inclusive. Like, we just, we just want to grow. We're very ambitious right now. Hmm. Uh, you each have had so much success um, in this space and definitely seem primed to continue. Uh, what advice would you give to an influencer or somebody who is ha already, you know, experiencing success on another media platform, what advice would you give them if they, you know, wanted to go into podcasting? I would say trust your instincts and no one has ever walked in your shoes. So you need to really kind of stay true to your own path and really stay on it and, and trust that what you're doing is going to have some pitfalls there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be um, times when you're not successful, you know, coming out of the gate. It takes time to build that audience. And, and I think that the way you do that is by staying true to what you really believe that whatever your podcast is going to be about. Staying true to that. Because the minute you see, oh, that's not working, and you try and, you know, change something, that, that throws your audience. Your audience, you know... Familiarity breeds familiarity, and people feel uh, a great comfort in having that familiar feeling when they come back time and time again to listen to you. And I think that that's a very strong component is just, just trusting that. Um, no, that. That's all great advice. Um, one, I, one simple thing I would add is um, make sure that you want to do it. You know, When it comes to podcasting, the that barrier so to entry is nothing anyone can start a podcast you know, yes. box you buy a microphone figure out how to you know put it online um you know and whether it's your manager or team telling you you should do a podcast or you know or because all everyone else is doing it um if you're not passionate about it you know it is it it's fun it can be very rewarding but it's, it's a lot of work consuming, it's yeah. very time consuming and you you have to love it um because to come up with the next episode is can be very challenging, you know. Everyone has, an, you know, they'll sit down with friends at a house party or at the bar, and everyone's like, "Oh, this would make a great podcast," and it probably would. But like now, you get to episode four, it's like, "What the hell do we talk about now?" <laughs> um, so yeah, you have to want to do it, you know. And so don't do it to be a follower or don't be pushed into it. And then my other advice would be just, you know, understanding that, you know, for me especially, especially when we're talking about like pop culture or, you know, current events, you know. 
we treat that aspect of our show just like a sports fan. I'm a huge football fan. You know, I can't get enough of uh, football podcasts. And I, I love the Green Bay Packers, <laughs> and I love hating the Minnesota Vikings, you know. And I have to remind myself that my audience sometimes either loves to love me or loves to hate me or loves to agree with me or loves to disagree with me. And I don't really care which one it is. I just care that they care because there is nothing worse than indifference or people not having an opinion about what I'm saying because then they're not listening. Uh, and the people disagreeing with what you have to say, they listen to every episode. Um, but that can be a strain on your mental health. So you have to have perspective as well when you go into it and, and uh, actually appreciate a disagreement and discourse rather than be resistant to it. Amazing. Love that. But if that happens, then you can be a guest on Christie's podcast. <laughs> yeah. Or I could yeah. be on Nick. Talk about my mental yeah. health. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> decline. Um, I think you need to understand the marketplace and see how competitive it is because it is... Like I said, like we're we're you know very video forward, and we understand that as uh, you know we put a lot of money into that, into the production costs and of you that. You can see it on the screen. Yeah. Again, self finance, and it's like no, we want to put our best foot forward. That is our our goal, and also too with the inspirational aspirational thing, we have people who, if they are not on active shows, we want to make them look their best, and we want them people to understand that they really are amazing you know what i'm saying so if you're going at this alone you know look at the marketplace be very realistic about what's the best product that you can put out in a competitive marketplace and you know and do that hmm. excellent advice excellent uh, advice podcasting is a lot like the early days of television and you know in those early days you could do whatever you wanted because a lot of it was started with local television affiliates and that's kind of what we're experiencing with podcasting. If you have an idea, like Nick said, you buy a microphone, you find a way to put it up on the web, and you do a show. So, you know, it's a great opportunity. This is a great time to be starting a podcast. And the one thing that will carry you through is, is the passion. I'm going to go back to that again. Just, you know, you can do whatever it is. You know, if you want to do a show about tennis shoes, do a show about tennis shoes. But just make sure you're passionate about that show about tennis shoes. So it really is a, is a wonderful time to be starting. And it's a wonderful time to be creative uh, in any way you want. And uh, that passion will hopefully just carry you through to a successful show. Wonderful advice. Wonderful advice. Well, thank the three of you so much for answering these amazing questions. I want to turn, though, now to the audience. Oh. We kind of hand raise some guy, and you have to say what to do. But for, please raise your hands if you have a question, but right up front, right here. Oh, we even have a microphone. I was going to say, oh, yeah, I think that you all have a microphone. This is like the Sally Jesse. Right I know, I'll hear her just fine. Or Oprah. Although I was going to say, days, you, were, yeah. you were projecting. So she was yeah. But. <laughs> oh, go Hi. right ahead. I actually have a question for Christy. Well, first and foremost, um, just want to appreciate what you're doing as a strong woman and the confidence you bring towards women all around. My question is, as someone who manages PodCo and also is a part of two podcasts, I'm someone who's a full-time uh, full media director and hosts my own podcast. How do you balance or prevent burnout from all the great things that, that you're doing? I batch content. I batch content. I think that's something that a lot of uh, sort of online creators tend to try to do to, to sort of balance it. It's kind of a hack. It's still hard, um, you know, because I'm traveling to a, a, a very different location than, you know, my local, although that could change, you know, I would love nothing more. I love Austin so much. I would love nothing more than to have a huge you know, studio here, and who's to say that we, we don't do that in the future? It'd be fantastic. But, um, but no, I batch content. Awesome. And thank you. That was a very lovely compliment. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name's Carmen. I'm an AI specialist, and I have a science communication project around how to demystify concepts in that field, right, and bring the social impacts of that to the fore as well, um, to share that information with folks. Um, so I have kind of two questions. Uh, one, Nick, you talked about strategy around like content to bring people in and then content to keep people 
you know, coming back. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you define what those two, like, um, would look like? How did you, like, did you experiment a lot? Did you already come into it with, like, this is going to be my content that's going to bring people in, and this is going to be my content that, you know, keeps co people coming back? And then a uh, second unrelated question is, any thoughts on, to everyone involved here, um, around managing bilingual qu content? So creating content in more than one language, because that is also something that I deal with. Thanks. Um, I would say everything I learned was on the fly. When I started my podcast, I didn't know anything about podcasting. Um, so it's been just a very, you know, quick on the job uh, learning experience. But once we started having success, you know, I immediately, the goal was always to grow. So, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, how do we keep growing? And then kind of once I understood the marketplace, uh, and realize the different, you know, things that we were doing on the show, then it kind of popped in my head, like, well, you know, because then you have these metrics, retention rate, and things like that, and, you know, people who find your show, and the people who drop off, and things like that. So I started looking at the different metrics, and then started figuring out, well, what works with each one. And then another aspect of just, like, growing the show, or just bringing in new audience members, something that's really been big for our show, uh, about a year and a half ago, you know, we've been on social media a lot, and first it was, you know, just making cut up clips of the, of, of the, you know, different segments that we're talking about, whether it's a pop culture topic or relationship advice, and, and that was really good marketing for the show, and that would bring people in, especially the relationship driven stuff, um, or the relevant guests. But then when we have a guest, what we started doing is just making these really dramatic, like what we're like movie quality sizzle reels for a podcast, you know? And the reason why I was actually texting with John Stamos earlier is because we have this idea for our next guest where we want John to do it, be a part of it. And we put a lot of thought and preparation into these sizzle reels for a podcast that most people don't think to do, but a lot of these videos will go viral and they'll reach, you know, audiences that I never expected. And, and people are, you know, just like, well, what is this show about? And, Again, if I'm just trying to get some person to just try the show, you know, just tune in once and then, you know, we believe in what we're doing that they'll stick around. So that that in terms of the growth strategy, social media and trying to just play in that playground and be creative and just try to do things that other people aren't doing. It was just like thought was like, why would you make like a movie Kind of movie type quality sizzle reel for an audio podcast. Well, it's you know, no, no one else is doing it, but it seems to really work because it's attention grabbing. You know, it's like I want it to feel like must listen or must watch content, and and that's been very good for the show. Oh, the bilingual thing. I do want to just mention. Um, sure. I'm currently uh, working with a company called Eleven Labs. Um, they're an AI <laughs> based company where they will actually manipulate your voice um, once you consent and write all the contracts. Um, and you will be able to have your voice in every single language. So I think it's kind of cutting edge, but it's really fascinating in terms of maybe that's something in the future that inevitably ends up happening. Yeah, to just echo that, in the past just few weeks, uh, I've been having a lot of conversations and meeting around what AI can do for for our business, and that's in, in exactly what you said. There, yeah. it's wild the technology that's out there, and and yeah. Like I said, consent. Um, but the, yeah, your ability to be able to take your voice and put it out in every language that's out there is around the corner, and it's kind of quite fascinating. Yeah. So just to clarify the point on that question, it was more around I'm bi bilingual and I can create and I do create content in two languages, but my issues around like how to reconcile and like make sure I'm not alienating one, like if I'm just doing one channel, I'm not alienating one, you know, audience when I'm putting one language and the Do you put them on, in the same feed? I've like started doing that and then I split and now I'm trying to figure no, out I how would to keep put them it together. again and it's just. Keep them together. Anybody that I know that has the most successfully been able to do, um, at least mo most of uh, my friends or colleagues who have done it, they've done um, Spanish and English. And they put them, and they'll release both episodes at the same time on the same day. They just have both episodes in both languages ready to go, and they keep them all on the same feed. And it makes it so that, yeah, so that both audiences can stay in lockstep together. 
Go ahead. Hi, y'all. Thank you for your time. My name's Ispri. Um, I'm the host of the Women in Tech podcast. And like Brittany, I've been in podcasting since 2014. My question's pretty simple. Um, I've dealt with a lot of different types of monetization for my podcast. And because podcasting typically is psychologically deemed as a free, uh, medium free entertainment, what would you all suggest to make it worth paying for? Because in some countries, it is really popular to contribute towards podcasts and be members of private feeds. And then some podcasters, like myself, really struggle with people wanting to pay for the content. And I would love to really lean into a membership model rather than always relying on sponsors. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that what, what you're feeling is pretty common. Um, I think my advice would be just to start it because you're always going to be met with resistance. You know, as soon as you, we have a premium option at the Vile Files for, you know, we call it Vile Files Plus, and we do it through supporting cast, and it's been really great. Um, and yeah, at first, you're going to get one, one and a half percent of your audience, maybe two if you're lucky. If you get three, you're a rock star. Um, and everyone else is very resistant. And you'll hear the noise and, and the complaints, but just start it and do it. And it will grow over time. So to clarify, I did. Okay. Yeah. So Great. I my question specifically, what kind of content would make it more valuable? Oh, you're saying what kind of exclusive content yes. should you offer yeah. pertaining uh, to yeah. the Women in Tech podcast? I it, for us, it's always what we call refer to as vile files adjacent. You know, like it's not like for example, we have a, a pop extra, which is like pop culture topics we didn't get to talk about in the week that we you know that we didn't talk about on the show. Uh, we talk about a lot of reality TV shows on the regular show. There's a million other reality TV shows we don't cover, and we recap it on Vile Files Plus. Uh, we do our advice section, and a lot of people got into the follow-ups. You know, what happens next? So the updates of the callers will put behind Vile Files Plus. And, and you probably tease it, right? Do you tease it? Yeah, and we you tease have to it. it. And so room. it's just something that is, uh, you know, very similar to what we're doing on the main feed that for your hardcore fans where they can't get enough of, it's it's mimicking what we're doing, but just a little something extra or you know a little al value added. So you want to definitely stay consistent with what you're doing, but just you know a little bit more granular. And that's you know you're you're, you're not going to get everyone. You're hoping to get the diehard fans who just can't get enough of what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, and just get as many of those as possible. Thank you. Hey, so thanks so much for this really cool panel. I have um, so I have a podcast and recently just hit top 10% most downloaded in the world. I am getting like a lot of attention. I don't really know how to handle it. Like I'm feeling very overwhelmed. Did that ever happen to you? And, and what did you do? Like what strategies did you use to manage attention? Well, first congrats. Thanks. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> Sounding obnoxious, it just kind of happened. Uh, like well, I mean, listen, I got, I, I was able to cut my teeth by going on reality TV, okay. and I was, if you didn't watch, I was the villain on the first season, yeah, you were. and that came with a lot of criticism and a lot of heat, and and I learned very quickly not to read my own press, you know, protect my mental health. I tell people, my peers who go on the show. Uh, the positive comments are more dangerous than the negative comments, you know, because if you are going on, you know, you're. We are not made to hear the opinions of the world. You know, social media is not, you know, good for our brains in that way. And so, and why, and the reason I say that is because if you're, on, if you're in your comments, you know, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're like, well, I am amazing. And then all of a sudden that negative comment slips in there. And if you're believing the positive ones from a bunch of strangers you don't know who don't know you, and you're believing those, then like, sub, like your subconscious brain tells you, well, I have to believe the negative ones. So, Believe in what you're doing. Obviously, what you're doing is working. The numbers show that. And so, back to what I said earlier, just be glad that they care. And, you know, know, th know that what you're doing is working and, you know, keep your head down, keep working. And, and I would just not listen to the critics, whether it's good advice or bad advice. What you're doing, you, what you're doing is clearly working. So, you know, Advice from the audience, it's nice to have praise, but I feel like it handcuffs you creatively because all of a sudden you're like, well, they want me to do this and they want me to do that. Well, you stop listening to yourself when you do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. All right, last question. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Steven Seidel, 
And uh, I created a podcast as well. It was called Wolves Among Us. And uh, traditionally, maybe two, three, four years ago, when podcasts were rising, um, there were a lot of limited series. And so that's essentially what we did is we created a limited series. But now we're getting a lot of pushback because people want to have this always on. It kind of seemed like maybe two, three years ago, you could build a really viable audience and then use that for derivative deals to TV and movies. Are you all experiencing that as well um, in terms of when you're creating your content? And if there's like hard, mine was about, you know, people with double lives, but like if you're creating this always on podcast, is it um, something that you're seeing in terms of turning these podcasts? Are you all like planning to develop them and are you seeing that trend? When you say develop them, do you mean like the IP of them? Yeah, to, to build it out, to use it as an IP channel. Are you, have you seen that that's become less popular, <laughs> more popular? We have some really big ideas um, in the uh, always on space that um, have not been met in the marketplace yet. We're really excited about the idea of fast channels. Um, and so I do think that there is a way and a future. You know, I think Snapchat's also, if TikTok does end up getting banned, um, I think Snapchat might be the future. I think you'll always have to be looking towards the next thing because it's always on. I think it's always developing too. So you gotta be kinda plugged into things. Yeah, and no matter where you are in the process, everything's always negotiable. It's always a wide open negotiation. And what I mean by that is this is constantly changing. The, the landscape of, of podcasting, television, radio, uh, everything is always changing. So there's always going to be new opportunities to negotiate. So I think you just have to be aware that you kind of have to, you kind of have to go with the ebb and the flow and just be aware of what can be new and what the possibilities are. Um, because you're always going to be able to negotiate a new deal about something. Thanks. Could I get a, uh, what, the, the little jackalope as well? Could I get one of those? That's a $750,000 charge, <laughs> I was told. Well, uh, fast seriously. as fast can be, you'll never catch me. <laughs> I am so immature. <laughs> well, Dave, Nick, Christy, thank you all so much. Thank you for Real coming. Thank you very much. Thank you all thank for you. your questions. Thank you.